grace, works, and peace be multiplied unto you from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your power, your display of yourself in Jesus. We thank you for the gift of the Spirit, which continues to tug our hearts and draw us ever closer to you. As we proclaim your word this day, may we rejoice. In your name, Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Let's share the text that is printed for us today. The Jews said, Jesus, who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. Very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple. Well, things are not always uh, what they seem. Even Jesus isn't always what he seems. Ask the average Joe or Jane to describe the Savior, and they'll come up with an endless list, an interesting list. They will tell you that he was good, he was kind, he was gentle, he was caring, compassionate, and forgiving. In truth, you and I are not what our public image projects either. Our insides don't often match up with our outside. We diet, we exercise, we wear makeup, we color our nails, we brush our teeth, we fix our hair. All to help our outsides look good. But no diet has been developed which can shape us from the inside. We may work hard to live in the right neighborhoods and drive the right car and dine at the right restaurants and send our children to the right schools and have the right people invite us to the correct social events. But there's no amount of work which we can do to make our really self right before God. During these past few Sundays, our messages have centered on the words and the miracles of Jesus in the Gospel of John. There are constant challenges by the Pharisees who were disappointed that Jesus did not fit their theological box. His miracles, well his first miracle was perhaps the strangest of all. At the age of approximately 30 or so, he showed up a wedding feast. And that wedding ran out of wine. In the village life in Galilee, a wedding brought tremendous celebration to the village and lifted the life to new heights. It usually lasted a week. The bride and bridegroom would make a gala presentation and procession through the streets of the town. Think of the scenes that you might remember from TV movies about weddings in Italian villages. There was dancing. There's platters of food, jugs of wine, weddings and laughter and music. Well, John is telling us that this was a moment of social crisis when the whole wedding party nearly came to a halt. The wine, the wine ran out. Now, Jesus, of course, we know, turned the water into wine, but it was a one-time event. When you read the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and also John, you're going to find that uh, Jesus healed hundreds and thousands of sick people. What began as a tragic tale of a man who was born blind ends in his healing, and the Pharisees become blind to who is in their midst. A paralyzed man has forgiven his sins and healed of his disease. Jesus was immediately censored as a heretic, because the man healed, it happened on a Sabbath. This healing posed a grave threat to the official doctrine. Jesus has stepped outside the correct theological box. The Pharisees, of course, could not disprove the miracle, but they remained blind to the reality that God was walking in their streets. The streets of their city. Now we know that Jesus was a great storyteller. He said he was like a gate for the sheep. He was like a shepherd 
who could lead his flock to pasture, and if one was lost, he would seek it out and carry it home on his shoulders. The Pharisees knew that he was quoting from Ezekiel 34, because God promised that if the ordained religious shepherds ever failed to take care of God's children of Israel, he himself would come. After the feeding of the 5,000 by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus told the disciples, Oh, go on across the lake. I'll catch up with you later. And he went up onto a mountain to pray. And then suddenly there was this frightening storm that blew down across the lake. And the disciples were rowing against the storm all the way. And late at night, Jesus joined them by walking on the water. It was in that moment the disciples realized that Jesus, he was God in their midst. The next day, the people came around the lake and they were looking for Jesus again. They wanted more food. They wanted another miracle. They wanted to make Jesus their king. Well, that would fit their theological box. In the end, Jesus was not their kind of Messiah. He would not provide bread and a circus on demand. The miracles attracted crowds and applause, yes, but rarely encouraged repentance and faith. In the winter, just a few months later, at the Feast of Hanukkah, the Jewish religious officials asked Jesus, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus said, well, I did tell you. I showed many miracles that could have only been accomplished by God himself. But you've chosen not to believe because you're not my sheep. My sheep know my voice and I know them. My Heavenly Father, your Heavenly Father, and I are one. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, you can't say that. And so they began to pick up stones and stone him. He said, well, I've shown you many great miracles. For which of these miracles are you stoning me? And they said, well, we're not stoning you for any of these miracles because you, a mere man, claim to be God. That's blasphemy. It wasn't long. A few short months go by. And we find Jesus raising Lazarus from four days dead. Well, that was the last straw. Jesus had to be stopped. Philip Yancey, in his book, The Jesus I Never Knew, writes, This resurrection of the one man, Lazarus, would not solve the dilemma of planet Earth. That would take the death and the resurrection of one man, one perfect man, Jesus. And so from that day forth, they plotted to take the life of Jesus. His signs and wonders stopped. And then they simply reappeared when his risen spirit gripped the disciples on the day of Pentecost. The preaching of the disciples was clear. We heard it moments ago. This Jesus of Nazareth was accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him. He was handed over by you, to God, in God's foreknowledge, who was then put to death by the Romans, nailing him to the cross. God had a plan. But God raised him from the agony of death. He's now seated at the right hand of God the Father. What you see now is the Holy Spirit poured out. Repent. Be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus was most certainly a disappointment to many Jewish in the population. He had not been born to feed their bodies with heavenly manna. He was born to nourish their souls and give them the promised gift of forgiveness and eternal life. So did it ever occur to you that Jesus was crucified because those around him thought he was too dangerous to let live? You see, a true Jewish rabbi would uphold the Old Testament laws and never talk to a Samaritan woman. And he certainly wouldn't touch diseased people. Jesus was in the temple courts. He was in a very serious discussion with the Pharisees regarding uh, offering forgiveness to this woman who had been, been found committing adultery. Jesus looked at the Pharisees and he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You notice Jesus did not say, I am a light. He did not say, I know where the light can be found. He did not say, I'm one of many lights. I am the light. 
Before Abraham was born, I existed. I can't forgive her. Now that's a problem. That's a problem for the Jewish rabbis because Proverbs 6.23 clearly states, the commands of God written in the Torah are a lamp, and the teachings of God in the Torah are light. If you follow the Torah, you will not walk in darkness. Jesus, this upstart rabbi who claimed that he was present at the creation of the world, said, you Pharisees are reading the scriptures, but you cannot see that your holy Torah, the word of God, has become flesh. The scriptures point to me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through faith in me. That's why he was too dangerous to let live. This is the difficult doctrine of the Trinity. God, the creator of the universe, has become visible. And the first five books of the Bible are now visible in the person of Jesus. And so when Jesus forgives sins, he was claiming the words of God and God's authority. His disregard for the Sabbath scandalized the Pharisees, breaking the Sabbath rules of Moses with a capital offense. He was a threat to the sacrificial system, to the temple, to kosher food regulations, and kosher people. In other words, Jesus is walking the streets of Jerusalem and the villages of Galilee claiming that he is replacing their first five books of the Torah. It did not go over well. No matter how many miracles he did, it got worse. When Jesus told his critics that he was without sin. But no single person offered any criticism. There was no one who came up with a catalog of transgressions. By the way, is your slate clean? Are your thoughts always clean? Well, neither is mine. That's why you and I need to say and that's why God came to the planet he created, to the people he created, to save us. He had to be perfect to take our place. After the religious authorities arrested Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went through six interrogations with some Jewish councils and the Romans, all in 24 hours. There was no fancy TV Perry Mason and no bull to create a perfect jury. Not a single witness rose to his defense. In the end, an exasperated governor simply pronounced a harsh verdict of death on a cross. Now you and I can never understand the Christian faith without understanding the cross of Christ. And we'll never understand the cross of Christ until we see that it was God's hand at work in Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. God presented Jesus Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through his blood, Paul writes. This phrase, sacrifice of atonement, translates a Greek word that means propitiation. Now, I think I've maybe used that word propitiation once or twice in my entire preaching career. I think Pastor Hughes used it more. <laughs> Few people have ever heard the word propitiation, and fewer still understand what it means. Here's the definition. To turn away wrath by offering a gift. Jesus Christ turns away the wrath of God by offering the gift of his perfect life. Propitiation. When Jesus hung on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, all the wrath of God against sin was poured out onto Jesus. He became sin for us. All of your broken commandments, all of your broken ethics were placed there. The sins of the whole world were poured out on Jesus. And in that moment, God simply turned his face away from his own son. And then when a sinner stops trusting in his own good deeds to earn God's blessings or earn God's love, and then puts trust in the death and the resurrection of Jesus, God simply transfers the righteousness of Jesus to everyone who grabs hold of the cross. When Jesus was crucified and buried, the Pharisees thought, oh, that's the end of his story. The message is silence. 
His ideas have been put to rest. His promise is buried in a borrowed grave. Well, things do not always as they seem. Three days after his crucified corpse was shut away and sealed behind a stone wall, Jesus came back to life. His resurrected, glorified body has changed human history, your life and mine. Propitiation became a reality. The Apostle Paul writes, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, well, it is that same Holy Spirit of the risen Jesus that now enables your heart and mind to believe the story. His story. To believe the resurrection to be true. Jesus promised that His Holy Spirit would be His physical replacement in the world, convicting the world of sin, and then coming to dwell in each believer. His Holy Spirit would, throughout our lives, produce spiritual gifts to expand the work of God on earth. His Holy Spirit would change our hearts so that our outsides would not need makeup or pretend kindness. His Holy Spirit gives us true goodness, sincere kindness, true gentleness, joy, peace, and faithfulness. And thus, by the power of the Trinity, we imitate Jesus. Go and do. Go and do. Amen. And now may the peace of our Almighty God and the mystery of our God continue to strengthen you and hold you in the palm of His hand until you're privileged to stand at His heavenly side. Amen.